David Garner, class of 97. If you could raise your wave, <laughs> raise your hand, wave. Uh, Melanie Mooney, 04. Beverly O'Connor, class of 70. Margaret Riley, class of 74. Margaret Joseph Vallow, class of 79. And thanks for all for joining us. In addition, joining us tonight is Kayla DeCosta, Senior International Program Coordinator. And I will now turn it over to Kayla. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for attending. Um, so I'm going to moderate the question portion of the panel tonight. Um, so if our five panelists wouldn't mind starting by introducing themselves, um, let us know what your major was at Portland, um, where did you study abroad, and a little bit about what you're doing now. Um, and David, do you want to get us started? Sure. So you, you said uh, when, when I went, where I went, and what I'm doing now, right? Yes. And what I, was your major at, when you were at Portland? Okay, so I was a biology major at Cortland, and I graduated in 97, uh, first time, and then I, I ended up, long story short, went back and got my master's there in 2002 as well. Um, I served in, and well, I did my internship in Belize, and currently I am a biology teacher, chemistry teacher, and an entrepreneur. Thank you. Uh, Melody, do you want to go next? Sure. Yes. Uh, yeah. So I went to China in 2004. I was an art major at SUNY Cortland. I went on to get my master's in art education and teaching English as a second language. And I'm currently an art teacher in Long Island. Uh, this is my 16th year teaching art at high school. And I have two kids, and I'm expecting my third right now, due in July. So. I have a growing family here, so. Congratulations. I started in Cortland. <laughs> Thank you. Love it. Uh, what about you, Beverly? Graduated in 1970, so I think that makes me the senior citizen here. Um, I went to Switzerland thinking that I was going to teach. Um, after grad school, I taught for six months and thought, oh, this was a big mistake. Um, and was in business for the rest of my working career. And of course, at 72, I am very retired and loving every minute of it. And um, get back to Cortland as often as I can. Yeah, I was a French major, art history minor. Um, studying abroad was the best thing I ever did. That's what we like to hear. <laughs> um, Margaret, what about you? Hi, um, I was a secondary social studies major at Portland, and I studied abroad in Dublin, Ireland in the spring of 1973. And I had a very brief career in teaching, which was lasted less than a year, <laughs> including summer school, because at that time there were absolutely no jobs for anyone in teaching. And uh, then I wound up in business uh, in the financial services industry. I had a career there. And in my 40s, I went to law school and became a lawyer and worked at a major firm in DC and then started my own firm with a partner. And we retired in 2018. So I'm very happily retired. Very nice. Um, and Joe, I believe you're our last one. Thank you. Um, Joe Vallo. I'm uh, class of 1979. I was a political science major. I participated in the London program in the fall of 1978. Um, after Cortland, I went to New York Law School. Um, I was an attorney, uh, litigator, uh, compliance director in the financial services area on Wall Street type thing. I, after 35 years, I retired in November of 2019. I'm currently retired, and as all retirees are, I'm living in Florida. Um, and um, uh, as as has been said, the the study abroad program was the best part, the very very best part of uh, of my experience. Wonderful. Um, I'm I'm sorry, I I missed the part. Uh, I also was in the London program. I mean, I'm not sure if that's, I'm supposed to introduce myself or not, because I signed in late, so sorry. 
That's okay. Uh, we were just having our five panelists introduce themselves. Um, we'll have a okay. little time at the end for questions and discussion. Um, got it. But great to hear. It sounds like we've got quite a few um, of our alum on, on, on this um, panel or on this uh, call tonight that have studied abroad. It's been great to hear the stories already. Um, so next up, take us back. Um, why did you choose to study abroad in the first place? Did you have a particular goal in mind when you made that decision? Oh. And anyone who wants to take that can go for it. <laughs> I'll go. I didn't uh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. studying abroad at all, but it was my mother who encouraged me to do it. And I'm very glad she did because I had a wonderful time. I met Sue Foley and uh, we became fast friends. And it was the most wonderful experience having being 100% Irish heritage. I had no real um, never really had the opportunity to study Irish history or literature before, and it was a great eye opener into the culture that all of my family had come from. I fully expected to teach, so um, obviously perfecting French would have been um, a great thing, which I did. Uh, my late husband was also a teacher before he went into uh, becoming a federal agent and um, we were able to speak French in front of our children and they had no idea what we were talking about. But, um, you know, I ended up speaking very, very good French in the business district, <laughs> not in the classroom. And I went because of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was my professor and he encouraged me to, to come and to be, he brought his whole family. He brought his uh, two children and his wife along on this trip to China. And I don't think I would have gone if it was with anybody else or on my own. I have to say that it was great to have my professor, my favorite professor, uh, along with me on on this trip to China. And we went, we did quite a bit of traveling in China too. It was not just um, we. I always tell my, that to my students. It was not like we went to Shanghai and stayed there. We we went all over. Well, I always say we went all the way to Hong Kong and then we went out west over by the Yunnan province and so we got quite a tour of uh, of China so it was definitely because of my professor if I if I didn't have him to encourage me then I wouldn't have gone for sure I think my, mine was kind of an evolution I I had taken marine biology with Dr. Rivest and we were in the group we did here and part of our field trip was a two week trip to Belize and also being a bio major, I did field biology at Racket Lake and, and there was actually a couple people that I knew that had done the Belize internship in the meantime. And so just in communicating with them after I had been there for two weeks and they had done it for a semester, it kind of just evolved that I was like, all right, let's try to get into the Belize program and, and go back and spend even more time there. And, and, you know, fortunately I got to do it for a whole semester. Um, and I, I went really just to, uh, I, I had never been out of the country. I was born in New York City and lived there, you know, and lived in New York my whole life. So um, at, you know, 20 years old, I was like so excited to go anywhere. And um, so I wanted to travel. I wanted to see Europe. And um, being a political science major, I thought that London was an economic air center and was a place where I could, uh, you know, get more information about law and economics, which I was both both subjects I was interested in. Great. Um, so some of you have already started to touch on this, but um, in what ways has the uh, did the study abroad experience change or solidify your choice of major and or career? Not at all. I'll go on this one. I so like I said, with, with the marine biology stuff, like that, that was one of my goals. I wanted to be a marine biologist, but I live in the Syracuse, New York area, and just like Portland, there's no ocean. And so I, I didn't really, we actually have within like 10 miles or like five, you know, it's like five, 10 minutes, five, 10 miles, whatever from my house is one of the most polluted lakes in definitely in the country, if not the world. And I just didn't want to find myself living in this cesspool of a, of a dirty lake forever. Um, but I, I ended up working with the fisheries department when I was in Belize and, you know, I, I already loved uh, biology and always loved science. And so it kind of just evolved 
you know, into that, but then it, it continued beyond that afterwards where, you know, I, I kind of did a bunch of random things after graduating, trying to figure out, okay, what am I going to do? Cause there's no ocean here. Um, which then led to the Peace Corps, which was a totally different story for later on. But um, that, that's kind of where I'm at and or how I was. I, I knew I loved biology, so it was it was a perfect fit because I, I did it as an internship, not as as study, necessarily study abroad. I wasn't taking classes. I actually had 15 credits, and I actually worked with the fisheries department. So if that comes up in questions, my my, my experience might be a little bit different from other people because I didn't actually take any classes when I was over there. But a yeah, great I, example uh, of how diverse study abroad can be. Yeah, exactly. No. Sorry, I, I was I was a political science major and um, took political science courses in, in London. And for me, it just verified the fact that I wanted to go into law, and um, and also what it what it added, which was great, was the international aspect of it. So throughout my career, I had an international um, focus. Uh, I was the um, uh, uh, director of compliance for International Private Client Group at Solomon Smith Barney. So I I had that the exposure to being in you know studying there. I felt that that was something I was really Created much more of an interest in, um, and I pursued it uh, throughout my career. Great. Would anybody else like to add anything? Um, I was going to say I was an art major. I always knew I was going to be an artist. I didn't really quite uh, know about a, a teacher as well. But when I after I traveled with, to China, that just opened up. I guess like the thirst or the hunger to see the world after I went there. And so when I went on to then for a degree in art um, in art education, I then traveled again and I studied abroad in Italy. And so um, it just uh, definitely solidified my major. It definitely is something that I bring up often in my class all the time about traveling and seeing the world and thinking globally constantly. That's actually the perfect segue into our next question. <laughs> so how did um, or did your study abroad experience change your global outlook? And if so, how? Well, I, I'll take a stab at this one. <laughs> um, when I was in Switzerland, we lived in a place called the Maison de Champrévert, which was like a big residential hotel almost. Um, students from literally all over the world. And when you walked in, there was a huge poster and it was a circle, um, all little stick figures around the outer circle dressed in every kind of foreign clothing you could imagine. And in the center, it said, when you're at Champ Prévert, you're a citizen of the world. And that totally set the tone for, for my experience there was I no longer was in my American bubble. I got to watch um, the student unrest in the late 60s and early 70s from Europe. And I saw how the world looked at America, just as the kids who go abroad now will see America through Black Lives Matter and political discord. And, and you get a whole different um, worldview that totally stays it stayed with me for the rest of my life and it was probably the most significant and valuable thing i took away from that experience was to um you know sit with a friend uh, a new friend from greece who's um there was a hunter going on at the time and couldn't get through to his parents he didn't know if they were alive and uh sitting with with babar from africa who's there was strife in his village. And here was this lovely man who spoke beautiful Queen's English and was worried about, um, you know, rebels and what was going on in his, his village in, in now Zaire. And you really, um, it really takes you out of your comfortable bubble in a way that you can't read about it. You can't, watch it on TV, you kind of have to go there and be there and just immerse yourself, which is why 
I hope for anybody who goes, don't go with 20 of your good friends because you'll stay in your bubble. Go with maybe a friend, it's good to have a friend, um, but you'll be much more open to becoming involved in those around you if you don't have your bubble with you. But the global perspective, um, as far as I'm concerned, was the best thing that ever happened to me. Yeah, I, I like the term how she used the word bubble and, you know, the whole comfort zone. So, uh, you know, to, to tie the two in, um, in teaching, I'm always bringing in some experiences of things that happened in Belize, but also when I lived in the South Pacific. And every year I do Peace Corps week with my students and I give them stickers and we watch, you know, a video of, of my experiences and my pictures and things like that. And, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I want to express to those kids. If like, like if they ever pick up anything about biology or chemistry, okay, that's a bonus, but I want them to realize that there's a heck of a lot more outside of their bubble that they live in. And, you know, whether it's uh, coaching. So like I coached lacrosse for 15 years as well. And whether it's in lacrosse or whether it's in, in school and in teaching, or as I mentioned, doing entrepreneurial stuff, it's, it only occurs outside of that comfort zone. So, you know, I always say get comfortable being uncomfortable because you've got to get used to that. And there are going to be some experiences. Now, I didn't know any of the people that I went with, um, you know, over, you know, at least in the uh, study abroad program, two of them were, uh, well, sorry, one of them was another Cortland student. One of them was actually a Binghamton, a Binghamton student. We actually had other students in joined through Cortland to do that. So, you know, there were a few of us there. Now, do we become great friends? Of course. And so that whole concept of, of just stepping outside and, and taking that risk and going and doing something different to see what's out there, you know, that, again, that led to me wanting to experience more cultures and, and get around, uh, you know, and see other parts of the world and continue to travel, which which I still try to, to you know, I know we can't travel necessarily right now. I can't even, we can't even get across the Canadian border, but, you know, I'm waiting to be able to get to that next trip to go experience some exotic place again, because, you know, you, you get the bug and you get the desire and the taste and you don't want to stop it. I would just, uh, uh, Beverly put it really, really well, and I would, I would absolutely agree with that. It was life changing, um, and stayed with, has stayed with me my entire life. Um, to be able to look at yourself and your country from another space through someone else's eyes is invaluable, and one that you, um, just for people who are considering this, the the answer is just do it because. You're never going to get that chance again as a young person with a very open mind. College students, particularly very open to learning and absorbing. And that's what that's what that's what the study abroad program did for me. It gave me this flood of new experiences and a new perspective, which was something that if I had done that or taken that trip later in life, it would never, ever have had the same impact or effect. Um, it's something that you need to do when you're at that age and you're open to it and you're willing to listen to other folks. When you get old, you stop listening, unfortunately, but that's, that's what, that's how it is. But it was an invaluable lesson and one that has remained with me forever and will remain with me forever. I think my experience was a little different in that um, the Dublin program was very small and there really weren't, at least if Susan, correct me if I'm wrong. There weren't any other international students in our program. It was people from um, various schools in the Northeast, and there were only about 20 students altogether. Um, so what really struck me, my first impression in getting off the plane and getting in a taxi to drive to the house where I was going to live was that, and I'm coming from Long Island and New York City where everybody is from different ethnicities. You've got a, a good mixture of people there. Uh, but driving from the Dublin airport to the house, I noticed the first thing I realized was all the names were Irish. And I thought that that was so odd. <laughs> is that, 
you know, there weren't any German names or Polish names or Jewish names or anything like that. Everything was Irish. And uh, in the country itself, it, uh, you know, I've been there a few times since in 2008 and 9 and, and 2019. And there's so many people coming in from other parts of Europe because of the EU membership. But in 73, they were Irish and there weren't any non-Irish people there that, that I ran across. And uh, just the whole concept of being in this kind of um, sort of maybe insular is too harsh a word, but you know, it's, it was very tight knit country and it was a very small country, it still is. And you can drive across the country in three hours so it, it's very small, but um, the experience that I had was that people were very friendly to Americans. Uh, everywhere you went, every house and every bar had a picture of the Pope and John F. Kennedy. So that was their idea of, um, you know, America was Kennedy and that, that kind of idealized version of, of American politics. And when Susan and I went hitchhiking around the country after school was over and we'd get a ride from someone and they'd say, where are you from? We'd say New York and go, oh, well, sure. Do you know my brother who lives in the Bronx? And we would say, no, we don't. <laughs> they had no idea of how big um, New York City was, you know, population wise. It was tremendously larger than the whole country of Ireland. So uh, it's just that, that different experience that not everybody lives in this huge metropolitan area and has a broad outlook on things. Yeah, I was going to say that when I went to China, I was completely humbled and um, blown away. And living from on Long Island, I did live in a bubble. And I realized when I went to China, we went to villages that did not have electricity or plumbing. And you just adapted and it, it was amazing. I, I remember that was the year I got a digital camera and the kids in the villages came over and they wanted to see, they never saw such a thing that I could take a picture and show them right away how they looked in this camera. And, you know, I remember also in some villages when they saw me, they would cry because they never saw, they didn't have a TV. They didn't know or have seen anyone that had looked like me before. So I, I remember being blown away, but loving it, loving every second of being in China and having a harder time coming back to Long Island and having an adjustment from from that and being completely humbled and my bubble was burst for sure. So exactly what you all were saying. That's wonderful to hear. Um, so we talked about this a little bit before we got started on um, what it terms to when it comes to life skills, but what skills or abilities did you gain while studying abroad? I think one of the, one of the is just patience, time management, being able to work with people that you know maybe you don't get a get along with or you know you don't see eye to eye with. Not that I didn't get along with people that I worked with there, but it's, you know, we were on island time half the time, you know, and from even where I am from just west of Syracuse, like growing up, you'd think that, okay, people that were from the, you know, downstate and the other side of the GW bridge, they, they live in a faster lifestyle down in the city than up in Syracuse. But, you know, you go to the tropics or you go someplace else and it's, you know, a day or two later when something should have happened in an hour. But again, it's, yeah, it's just a lot of it was patience and also, you know, learning to live within a really, really small budget and with limited means and with, with limited supplies. You, you go over there and, you know, they tell you, okay, we'll pack a bag or pack two bags. And then if you pack two, cut it in half because you really won't ever use half the stuff you or that you brought. And you just realize that, you know, we have so much extra that, you know, we don't necessarily need that we can, we can live without and, you know, it's funny that Melanie said that the thing about the digital camera, like, I wish I had a digital camera back then because I, I had so many rolls of film, but a lot of times I wouldn't know it was on the pictures until a couple months later when I got home. And so to be able to see that instant gratification or have that now is totally different. Um, but yeah, it, it's just, you know, like I said, time management and just personality skills, those those are just some big ones that you can carry over into anything that you deal with. Uh, what was so different for us, um, having been there 
in 69 and 70 was it was very expensive to call home. I spoke to my parents one time in the five and a half months I was there. And so being on your own took on a whole different meaning, um, making yourself understood to people who didn't speak your language. Um, one of the girls I got to be friends with spoke enough Italian, thanks to uh, Professor Dieter Kuster. I spoke enough German to order beer, which was a very good skill to have when we went to Oktoberfest. Um, all you had to do was raise your hand, actually. It didn't, didn't matter. You didn't even have to open your mouth. Um, but um, it, not everybody is you. Not everybody is American. Not everybody speaks English. Not everybody cares that you don't have what you want at that moment. And it really, it really sets you back um, to let you know that, um, that the world isn't all about you and you have to make your own way. And um, I think I probably grew up more in those five and a half months than I did in, in my other time at Cortland because, um, you know, I mean, there were, there were, there were people, there were directors and, and stuff, but um, day to day, you had to figure yourself, figure yourself out. And um, nice to know we, we were able to do it and we survived and um, without a cell phone. <laughs> yeah. How did I, you do I, it? <laughs> I don't know. That, that was just going to say, that's the same, same thing. I was there in, in 78, no cell phone. I didn't talk to my parents at all. I was the oldest. It was the first time I was ever away from home. And I think the thing that I that I learned was doing things for myself and on my own. I had to get my meals every day. Nobody, there was no dining hall. We had to find local restaurants, and I used to pay forty pence or forty p to get a bowl of porridge, which is oatmeal and toast every morning. And then I'd go for you know some other place, and I, and, I, and you just had to figure it out. And you have to feed yourself and you have to do all this stuff. And I, I traveled to Ireland, to Meg's point, um, and I went to Dublin and then I hitchhiked from Dublin to Waterford, Waterford and Cork. And myself the whole time. And I had one panic attack um, because I was alone. It started to get dark. And I arrived. I was in the middle of nowhere. I down and he said, Don't worry. Oh, and I'm like, Oh, thank you. I was like, So, you know, I, I probably would look like a complete wreck, but but I but I managed it. I figured out how to get through the next bed and breakfast, and I survived. And I got through the whole trip by myself without my parents saying, Don't worry, we'll be there in 15 minutes. So it was great. I would agree with that, um, with Beverly and with Joe. Uh, we had no, I had no phone calls with my family. The whole time I was there, um, but the good thing about Dublin was they had mail delivery twice a day. So if you were lucky, you got a letter in the morning from somebody, a good friend or family. And in the afternoon, when you got home, you had a chance to get another um, another letter if if you didn't get one in the morning, or you got two in a day, which was like superb. But um, I lived with the family, so they provided the meals, so we didn't have that challenge. But um, having to find a place to do laundry because that wasn't available. Um, I had hair down to my waist, so um, learning to wash your hair very quickly because the hot water supply was extremely low. There was not enough hot water to wash your hair and take, take a bath. There was no shower at the same time. And the, uh, the woman I lived with, she always had the windows open. And Ireland is cold in the winter. So after the first day of, you know, that I realized that I would sneak into the bathroom about a half hour before I was going to take a bath and close the window so that it would warm up slightly before, uh, before that. Um, but I, I would say the, the skills of self-reliance and resilience. I mean, I too it was the first time I had traveled without my family. Um, and just I realized that when I was on the plane and I didn't know a soul and then you know after a while I realized the two girls in the row behind me were Sue and Kathy who were the other two girls from Portland going to the program and so uh, you still and we lived on the next streets so I lived on one and they both lived on another with different families but uh, it was quite a, a good experience that 
you know, reading maps, trying to figure out where you are, bus schedules, that sort of thing. Uh, it was uh, it's a bit of a challenge. I realize now that um, I was kind of the princess because we did have a fabulous dining room uh, at the Maison de Chambre there, which we um, got every meal except Sunday dinner. Um, and we had Spanish cooks who cooked gabrito goat at least 11 times a week. And I tell you, I have not ordered goat since I came back from Switzerland <laughs> because I had goat up to here. <laughs> but um, everything else was really fabulous. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was a whole different way of eating. And breakfast was fresh baked bread and, and cafe au lait. And, and that was it. <laughs> That's what you did, and um, I mean that was fine, except for the goat thing. Yeah. <laughs> so a fun question: What's your favorite memory, or what's your favorite story from studying abroad? Tell us the good ones. I would say traveling after school was over with Sue Foley, and visiting her family. Uh, we visited her uh, relatives in County Offaly, where my, some of my family is from as well. But um, it was it was an eye opener. They were lovely people, and uh, their house had a peat cooker. They didn't have central heating. They did not have indoor plumbing. There was the outhouse in the backyard, and you know there was the chamber pot, which I thought had disappeared centuries before. It was still in use in Central Ireland in 1973. Uh, they did have electricity and television, however, so um, they we were watching television with them one night. And what was it, Sue? So Nero Wolf, the big the detective from Beverly Hills. <laughs> they all thought we lived in mansions in Beverly Hills and drove Lincoln Continentals. <laughs> so, um, and then we went to County Cork and visited Sue's cousin, a nun, who um, worked at a home for unwed mothers. And that was quite an eye-opening experience uh, from another perspective altogether. I mean, at that time, you know, Ireland is a very Catholic country. It was extremely Catholic then. And these poor girls were, um, they were disowned by their families and they could not go home. So it was quite, um, quite moving and heart-wrenching to see that situation there. But her cousin was the cook and I'll never forget the steam pudding that we had. <laughs> Yeah. My uh, my memory is the first day that I got there because remember it was an overnight flight and we got there and I just stood in the street and I, where our I was our place was at the Y Hotel and the Y Hotel is in the West End near the Brook near the British Museum and it's basically the YMCA by the way um, and so I stood there and I looked up and I'm I thought oh, oh my God. Joe Vallow from Brooklyn, New York, is in London, England, and I just started to run, and I ran to Piccadilly Circus, and I ran to Oxford Square, and I ran down to Buckingham Palace, and I literally was all over the place. My first day, I was exhausted, but I wanted to make sure that I took everything in in the first day, and just talking about it, I, I can feel the excitement and the adrenaline pumping as I, you know, 20 years old, so I could do this stuff, but running, literally running up and down saying, oh my God, there's Ben, and oh my God, there's a It was exhilarating. And from there, it went uphill. So it was great. I, I kind of, this is what Melanie was hinting at. Um, I, one of one of my memorable experiences in Belize, um, you know, it's a Central American Caribbean nation, and you know, if, if we think about just color barriers, here I am, this six foot two tall redhead with with a red goatee. My nickname all through high school was Shaggy, and so I would run around, and I had a lacrosse stick. So so right there, two things like first of all, they had never seen a lacrosse stick or what lacrosse was, and here I am being like the first white guy that, that a lot of the people had ever seen because we would go on some trips with, with some of the other people that I worked with. And I just remember this one little like four or five year old girl. She like went over to her mom and she was like, mommy, what's wrong with that man's hair? Because, you know, she had never seen red hair before. And so, you know, it's just it's just that whole idea of, you know, different cultures and stuff. But 
I mean, traveling around, you know, like Joe said, it, it's it, trying to experience everything. It's like, oh, there's there's a reggae band coming to the hotel. Like, okay, let's go watch it. Oh, we're going to go to Guatemala for the weekend and go shop across the border. Okay, let's do it. We're going to go to Mexico and go across the border. Okay, I'm there. And so, you know, oh, we're going to scuba dive next week, next weekend. All right, all right, let's do it. Just trying to get in as much as you can because you don't you don't want to have anything that you left behind and be like, oh, wait, I was here for four months or five months and I missed this. So just just yeah, I know you can maybe not ever see every single inch of it and do every single thing, but just trying to do as much. I mean, so, so there's so many memories, but those are some of the big ones. I think one of the things that Cortland did was they provided us with um, incredible travel experiences. You know, as the group, we were Cortland Binghamton uh, Harper study abroad. So we had we did have a, a couple other kids from other colleges, and we spent Christmas in Florence, which was lovely. And because I was really tired of um, the four thousand three hundred and twenty churches we got to see, um, I did learn to learn to drink Campari with the bus driver. Um, <laughs> Monsieur Fontana, who became a very good friend, but we got to go to the Sistine Chapel. And now I understand from my daughter who's, who was there three years ago, everything is timed. You have to get on a schedule. Well, when we went, it was the 12 of us and maybe 10 other British schoolboys. And that was it in the entire Sistine Chapel. And our guide was Contessa Lely who took the Kennedys and the Kissingers around when they toured Rome. And she was this little tiny black lady all dressed in black and she had a staff. And those British schoolboys were acting up and she took her staff and she pounded it on the marble floor, which reverberated like you cannot believe in an empty Sistine Chapel. And she said, there will be respect in this house and the hair on the back of your neck just stood up and everybody just kind of straightened up because that was that was just what you did and then she took us to the roman forum and it was a little drizzly it was foggy and if you couldn't see the senators sitting in the tiny forum which is not big like it is in the movies on tv it's a very tiny little little building again on the steps where Caesar died. It's just these kinds of experiences that Cortland provided because they did the itinerary, they got this person to take us around. Um, it, it, it was so extraordinary. It was just life-changingly extraordinary. I have a favorite memory. I have a few. So um, one of them was we were there for the thousand year anniversary of porcelain and Jing the Zhen. So there was a symposium. So artists from around the world came to this. And this was so cool because they had the red carpet. They had news anchors to interview you. We were uh, representing America. I felt like a beetle, but not a beetle. I had no idea it was that big of a deal. I felt like a celebrity. They put on performances in the auditorium. And it was so cool. We spent like four or five days in Jing the Zhen where porcelain originated a thousand years prior. And that's why we were there. So that was so cool beyond belief that I always think about that. I remember wearing like I'm American artist, delicate necklace around my neck. And so that was one of the cool memories that I remember. Um, and then another one, I have a few, but um, I remember Jeremiah, I don't know if you remember, but we were in the countryside and, you know, we were... You know, after a while, sometimes the food was getting kind of redundant. Like what you had for dinner was sometimes what you had for breakfast. Like they didn't have like egg sandwiches or, you know, like what we were used to, but we have this stink um, breakfast food and dinner food. So I remember we were like craving pizza and we looked up like in the countryside and there was a pizzeria and we were like going nuts. We like all took a picture in front of this pizzeria for some reason. And it was so good. And the guy was talking to us. He had, a, he was from Italy. And he had, he would speak uh, Mandarin, but in a, an Italian accent. And he moved to China because he met a wife there or something. But I remember, because we were dreaming of pizza, like we would talk about food all the time. Of like, what's the number one food that you miss? What do you wish you had? And we like 
dreamt it and it came true. We had pizza. And I know that sounds so silly as a memory, but we took a picture to document how great that pizza was. <laughs> and it probably wasn't even that great, but it, <laughs> at the time it was. As much as we love all the fun new things we could try when we study abroad, you all, sometimes just need a piece of home. So, um, so we do want to open it up for questions, um, but I do have one more quick, quick question to ask our panelists. If you could give one piece of advice to a prospective study abroad student, this is my favorite question to ask anybody, what would it be? So one piece of advice for a student, current student considering studying abroad. I, I want to do, do it. I, this is easy. Do it. Yeah, just do it. Just do it. Don't think about it. Don't if you just do it, you will never, never, ever regret it. Ditto. Joe said, absolutely 100%. However, you have to make it happen. If you have to go into hock, whatever you have to do, get yourself on that boat or that plane and go. Go. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at you, Alexandra, Alexis. I'm looking at all you. You better go. <laughs> I'm telling you. <laughs> You'll never regret it. <laughs> I would definitely say definitely do it. But the second thing I would say is to be open minded. Be as open minded as you possibly can when you go. Well, thank you all so much for sharing your experiences with us. Um, now it's time to open the session up to questions. So if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and I'm going to hand it back over to Shauna. Great. It was so nice to hear all these stories. I just sitting here laughing and smiling and thinking, oh, how I wish I were all of you at that point and how exciting that was. And Alexis, I did see her looking at you specifically trying to get you to go. <laughs> Um, so Hugh asked a question to any of the panelists who at Cortland was was an influence in helping you to study abroad. Anybody? The uh, when I when I did it in when I did it in seventy eight, there was a guy Willie Ushald who was the head of uh, the international program, and he was he was just great. I mean, he just. He he wanted people to go, so he just really made it like um, I, I don't want to say easy because at that time we had to pay for it uh, extra for it, which you say, understand you still do. But you know you had to come up with the money and you had to figure it out. I worked three jobs that summer before I I put myself through college, so I didn't have the extra money. I did whatever I had to do, but but he was so encouraging and said basically what we're saying to you all today, which is if you do it, you will never regret it. It will be a wonderful experience for you. And if you can do it, do it. So I would say he, he was the person who influenced me at Cortland and the, and the staff of the international office, because that's what it was called at the time. Joe, I'm, Q is saying that Willie is still around. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if oh, I could share, God. he he just had his ninety fifth birthday. Oh my! Yeah, no, uh, and I'll uh, add, um, I'm I'm Mary Schlarb. I'm director of the international office now, and uh, this I just want to say that I feel like I just traveled vicariously through you. So thank you at a time oh. when we can't travel. But I want to say that Willie, um, there's a scholarship. Um, in his name, and I think it's about eighty thousand dollars a year. That we give out in scholarships right. in his name. So Fantastic. Um, I think there might be something about how he was very good with managing the exchange rate and so was able to <laughs> accrue some funds and they established the fund through that. So anyway. My um my late husband worked with Willie uh for three years. Willie kind of didn't really want to go back and forth to, you know if there was a problem with a student or whatever. So while my husband was getting his master's at Cortland and at the University of Neuchâtel, he, he was the Willie. And um, the two of them um, got to be very, very close, very good friends. And I was, um, I, I was very privileged to spend a lot of time with him and learn um, of his efforts in the war. Um, he, was, he was the secret agent man and he was, he was a pretty cool dude, I have to say. Um, 
And he was so furious with me when I had a trunk sent over to Neuchâtel because I couldn't possibly pack everything in my suitcase. And he had to take me to the train station to, um, to pick up my trunk. And the whole time it was, oh, oh, Mademoiselle Dobbs, oh, Mademoiselle Dobbs, oh, and his German accent, he was just so disgusted. And we got to the train station, he wouldn't help me put the trunk in the, in the car, in the trunk of his car. And I have to say, long blonde hair, 20 years old, you just rely on the kindness of strangers. And I just found some guys to help me put that trunk in his car. And of course, I left it there because um, I didn't have the heart to ask him to take it back to the train station when I came home. <laughs> oh, he was such a treasure. I am, I am just thrilled that he is, he's still breathing. <laughs> what a piece of work. <laughs> Mary, did you have another question? Um, yeah, I, you know, we're, we're working, um, we have, uh, all of our study abroad programs have been postponed or suspended. And so we have some students, uh, working virtually, uh, they're doing internships with our Indian partner in Southern India. And so, um, Alex Belas, who's a director of the Clark Center and he coordinates international studies. He and I are, are doing a session with the students on, um, on really in the workplace, uh, how do they uh, use their experiences, their intercultural experiences and, and, um, and their skills to negotiate, for example. So I'm wondering your teachers, your, or retired teachers, your, you were in business, you were lawyers, has the experience of applicants for jobs at your companies or your schools, um, their international experience ever influenced your decision decision to hire them? Yes. And yes. why would you hire somebody who had a study abroad experience over somebody who didn't? I guess that's a long question, but no, I, there, there's that's a big, big yes. I would mm -hmm. I I see uh, you know I I worked for in I was in house counsel compliance director, and then I was in a big law firm. Um, and I would see international studies on a resume and instantly focus on it. And that person got pushed to the front of the line. Um, I know what the experience was like, and I know what, how it changed me. And I have to presume that it changed them. And it, it was, you know, it, it was, it was a plus absolute plus that person at least would get pushed to the top of the pile or an interview or something like that. Um, because I thought that that person was uh, unique and special. Right. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think. I haven't that, um, Go ahead, Beverly. Go ahead. Okay. No, I, I think that, um, let's face it, we want to work with interesting people. We just do. And people who are open to that kind of experience and who have done that are usually just more interesting. <laughs> so it was very self serving <laughs> in a way. But um, I, I just loved that um, that they would open themselves up and and just be that and do that. So yes, I totally agree with Joe. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I haven't necessarily hired someone, but I know firsthand for personal experiences that having international experience has, has put me to the top. Just because they see that there's that global perspective, they see that you had the ability that you're not afraid to step out of your comfort zone. You've worked with people from all different parts of the, you know, different cultures, different customs that, that you can have that global perspective. So I, it definitely, it definitely is like a highlight or, you know, something that's going to pop out when, when, you know, some employer is looking uh, to hire someone. So pop that at the top of your resume for sure. Yeah. I, I would also add that I worked for international banks. So, if you have somebody with in, any international experience, it's key because dealing, just dealing with these people, folks from different parts of the world um, is not something that a lot of people have. Uh, and if, if they do have that, that really does help me. I was, you know, as director of international private client group compliance, I, I needed people who could talk to someone in Australia and Hong Kong and Shanghai, wherever, and be, and not offend them. <laughs> You know, and be able to conduct business that way. Key, absolutely key. Perfect. Can I quote you all on those? 
<laughs> comments. Just, just, Thank just, you. Just get, the, just, get the, just get the spelling of the name right. We're good. Okay. Okay. Good. We'll get the transcript, Shauna. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. There was Thanks so much. Another question from Kathleen. Was there a financial difference between a semester on campus at Cortland and a semester studying abroad comparatively? So Kathleen and I have actually been chatting. Um, sorry, guys. Um, but to answer Kathleen's question, so everybody knows um, our study abroad programs range um, quite dramatically in price. Some of our um, programs, like the Belize internships, are less than a semester um, at Cortland. Um, and then some of our programs, like our program in Ireland and our program in London, are almost twice the cost of a semester here at Cortland. So there's really uh, a range of prices, but there's also a range of aid that exists. Mary mentioned we've got some great study abroad scholarships. There's a lot of free money out there if you're willing to write some essays and do some interviews. Um, so don't think that study abroad is too expensive. There's a lot of great opportunities out there and a perfect fit for every student situation. Yeah, that, thanks for raising that, raising the availability of the scholarship. I was on the foundation, the Cortland Foundation Board of Directors um, for many, many years. And we, and there's a lot, there's not a lot, but there's enough money out there for, for these sorts of uh, situations. So, and, and, and to be fair, they don't get enough people to apply for that money. So that money just sits there many times. So if you want to go on this program and you need the money, apply to those scholarships. People on the foundation, like I was on it for many years, we're thrilled when people actually get to use that money. That's what it's there for. That's why we donated it. It's great. The phone's going wonky here. Does anybody else have any other questions that they would like to ask the panelists? No. I have a quick question. It's a quick question. Yes. Yeah, yeah this, absolutely. This is a big question for all of us internationalists. When travel reopens and it's feasible to travel safely, where are you going next? Italy. Yeah. I, I, I was supposed to go for, a, I, I'm retired now and I was supposed to go last, last year, last summer. We were going to, we rented an apartment in Florence in the Altrano section of Florence and we rented it for a month. And so our goal is in retirement to spend one month in Italy every year. And COVID kind of got in the way of that last year and this year. But next year, I will be in Florence for a month traveling through Tuscany and enjoying the heck out of it. Well, as I said, I'm pregnant with my third child, so I'm not traveling anytime soon here. So, but I, before I started having kids, my husband and I traveled quite a bit and um, our passport is fully stamped and everything else. So I've, we've traveled a lot and sometimes like I have students, cause I always ask them like, name a country. I probably have gone there. Like, yeah, we play games and stuff. And they say, well, what's some place you haven't gone that you want to go to? That's on my bucket list probably for like my rest of my life is I would love to go to Vietnam. My dad was in Vietnam and he served for 13 months there. So I would love to redo the tour he did and see what he did. My dad had suffered from post-traumatic stress his whole life. So um, I feel like I would love to like document redoing his tour. I, I know he left like a watch on a beach that he's talked about her, her whole life. Um, there's a lantern that I've had in our living room that I would like to return, like just certain things that I feel like in my life, that's not going to happen for another like 30 years, but um, I, that's on my bucket list that I would love to do and document it if I could. So. I just recently got engaged and um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, <laughs> I know it's never too late not done yet um, and we are we are seriously thinking about um, I love um, ancient Mayan and Aztec history um, absolutely enthralled and if I could go to Teotihuacan, Machu Picchu, uh, Tikal pick one pick three while we're there might as well do at least three um, 
that's that's our next stop. I'm always open to going to Italy, but um, I would also like to see a lot of other places that I haven't been, like Australia, New Zealand, um, you know, Switzerland. Oh, Switzerland we've been to, <laughs> um, but Scotland, England, Wales, uh, Germany, where I was born, I've never been back. So I would like to um, actually see where I was born and uh, just anywhere that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I went on a cruise a couple of years ago and I only went into Bailey City, Bailey City, but I could only, I couldn't even like go across the, the like the, the fence because I was like stuck and then I could go back out to an island, but I would love to travel around again, and but actually do it with my kids this time. And so just have them be able to experience some of that. Um, I'd love to get back to the South Pacific where I was in the Peace Corps because I'm Irish. I've never been there before. Of course, I'd like to do Ireland. So they're, they're all possibilities. I'm, I'm still pretty young, so one of these days it'll happen. Thank you, a tour of the world. That was great to hear. We, I think we all can't wait till something opens up so we can all do just something. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Any more questions? Oh, we just got one, hang on. I have been, let's see, I've been to Egypt, Greece, and Italy, but going back to Sal Salmonica and Spain is next. I have not been there since my semester in 1973, and my family is also anxious to experience the adventures. Sorry, it's hard to read a chat. I know Salamanca has grown considerably, but the university and the history and the quaint beloved space all still beckoning. Who, who put that one in? Patty. <laughs> Hi, Patty. <laughs> that was great. It's as you say, it stays with us forever. And it's just um, I would also urge um, if we're going to counsel future students for going that the students believe in themselves, always feel confident in your ability. You're in a foreign place. You're by yourself, perhaps. Um, in, when we were in Salamanca, of course, nobody spoke English then back then in 1973. We live with families, but we learned. We learned how to believe in ourselves. We learned how to stumble through. Um, the people were absolutely extraordinary. And I know that all over the world, people are just that way. They have big hearts and big souls and especially thrilled when we try to speak their language or when we try to learn it. And, um, and of course, in time, we became very fluent. But um, always believe in yourself. If I could say one thing to prospective students who are going to study overseas, believe that you can do it you're there to learn you're there to experience the whole world and everything in it and you will do beautifully just believe and and work on that language because you will you will get there and uh, you'll never forget it ever and the people people all over the world are, are just extraordinary and, and you'll meet you'll know that you'll learn that so it's can't say enough i'll have to write a book <laughs> and then also to thank Cortland for just encouraging that that our whole life there. I know I believe all of you here feel the same way. There's something about Cortland that is just more so extraordinarily overwhelmingly special. It, it's always with our souls, no matter how far away we might live or how infrequently we can get back there. It, it's just always in our soul. Um, also, I had a phone call just from President Ditterbaum last week. He said, hey, we're just calling alums to say hello and see how you're doing. And it was the most overwhelming surprise of our life. You know, he called, he called alums, he called us, he spent an afternoon calling us to see how we were doing. And I, I just, I, it was emotional. It was absolutely glorious. So we're communicating now, which is absolutely wonderful, but that's Cortland. That, that is who it is and what it is. It, it's extraordinary. You know, and so I think all um, of you today. <laughs> Cortland um, has, obviously I met my husband there and when he passed away, uh, Eric was one of the first phone calls I got, oh. uh, which was tremendously special. And um, about a month and a half ago, um, a friend who still lives in Cortland, she actually works up at the college still, she'll be retiring, called me and said, have you gotten a vaccination? And I said, um, oh, gosh, Western New York is just the worst. Uh, haven't, haven't been able to get one. She said, okay hung up the phone, called me back a half hour later, said, what are you doing Sunday? 
And I said, I don't know. But she goes, I'm getting shots for all the people I love who I don't want to see die from COVID. So she was up for three weeks from 12 o'clock till four o'clock in the morning every night getting 89 friends COVID vaccinations because that was the sweet spot. And apparently for, well, five or six weeks ago, that was the only spot in Western New York that you could try to hop on if somebody canceled and to get in. And so she got <clears throat> Paul and I vaccinations and he goes, you know, he went to a big fancy school, uh, which I shall not name. Um, and I said, who got us the COVID shot? That's right, a friend from Cortland. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, um, my heart is, uh, will always be in that place in central New York. Mm -hmm. Best place ever. Yeah. You can actually get shots in Cortland on campus. Uh, there's <laughs> availability in, in the uh, park center, the little PER center. So it's uh, an option. <laughs> Well, we're done now. We're good. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed hearing everybody's story and I want to say thank you to the alums who participated and thank you to the international programs for joining us and making this happen as well. And we hope you all enjoyed yourself too and having the opportunity to connect with each other. Um, you will thank you to Shauna for putting all of this together. Oh, thanks. Both of us. <laughs> you made my life so easy. <laughs> well, I've enjoyed it because I loved hearing everybody's story. So every time I got to talk to somebody, I was so excited because I would love to go to all those places and all their stories. You you literally feel like you have gone and you feel their excitement. So I just, it's been a wonderful opportunity. So I really appreciate it on my side as well. It's great so to hear the story. Story. Definitely. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Susan, don't go. Bye, Jeremiah. Okay. All right. Love you. <laughs> uh, you, you as well. They, Meg, they may cut us off. Oh, I hope not. Do, do you want me to give you my phone number? Yeah. What's it? What is it? 607-722-2403. And what are, what's yours? You're in? Um, Maryland, 443-632-5542. Okay. Okay. Good. Oh, by the way, that's my landline because I'm still old, Meg. I do have a <laughs> cell Well, I'll call you right now, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cortland. Thank you. Thank you. I think Jeremiah wants to talk to you. I just wanted to uh, mention you were in Ireland in what year? 73. Yes. Uh, I as well. And, but Please. as a vagabond and uh, nothing official, but um, how amazing of a time to be there during yeah. all the troubles mm -hmm. that were happening. It's true. And in yeah. fact, first um, weekend we got there, I needed to buy a hair dryer, and so <laughs> I, um, you know, asked the the gentleman that I lived with, the the family there, and he told me to go to this particular electronic shop. And after Sue and I went there, I think together, yes. and um, you know, got the hair dryer and. On the way out, I looked and there was this huge building and it was the general post office. And yes. that is where they were, had actually been a bombing just the weekend before. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. yeah. And, and, uh, and the first uh, the first bombings over the border, as I remember, from yeah. the north. I, I, I was there in 73 to 74, so about a year and a half, um, uh, taking a leave of absence, I guess, uh, I would call it. But in fact, it was the beginning of my interest in internationalization, but the perspective of the Vietnam War from a European perspective and uh, all of the things that as a young guy, I just had no awareness of, but um, what a fascinating time. I just had to mention that. So I stayed on and I didn't take any of your cell phone numbers down or your landmark, so don't worry about it. Well, speaking about the Vietnam War, when Sue and I were traveling in Switzerland, we were in the German speaking part 
and we had had our high school and you know year or so of college French, and we were just terrible at speaking French. So um, <laughs> we could barely order du TLA. <laughs> we were starving. Anyway, we were trying to find the train station. So in our best accent, we said "Ue Lagar," and the guy said "Whoa!" In Vietnam, of course, <laughs> "Ue Lagar," the war. <laughs> so yeah. oh. Beverly would have appreciated that one, but. Yeah. Um, you know, that well, was our snarky answer that we got to our <laughs> attempt to speak the other language. Well, thank you all for uh, being part of this. I, I thoroughly.